and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon sponsored review time again, and and I. Every time I closed my eyes, there was a raccoon laughing at me. Um, anyway, today we're back to the New 52! Oh, so that's why it was laughing. Yes, we are returning to a previous Patreon-sponsored episode with this one, Batman the Dark Knight. You might recall that it featured the premiere of Batman's newest, greatest, and most deadly opponent ever, One Face! This comic has nothing to do with One Face or the plot with the White Rabbit involving her using Venom to beef up Batman's foes. And that's especially hilarious because the issues we're looking at today are about the Mad Hatter. The original creative team left after issue 8, possibly being forced out. Details are sketchy, but it was the first year of the New 52, and that was common. With Greg Hurwitz taking over writing for the remainder of the book. Now, I admittedly haven't read these issues, but checking out the solicitations for them, it seems Hurwitz decided to take the book's direction to let's create new origins for all the Batman villains in the wake of the New 52. I could be way off on what's actually in the books because I have neither the time, inclination, nor the money to look into whether that's the case, but the solicits mention a recounting of Scarecrow's origins, the Mad Hatters, Clayfaces, Man Bats, and the tie-ins to the storyline Forever Evil reveal the origin of the new ventriloquist, who was awesome by the way. Honestly, it's not a bad idea given the reboot and all that, but the method is questionable. There was no advertising of this being some kind of essential reading for these new origins, and then having them be six-issue storylines was the cherry on top of that kind of decision-making. Sure, the origins are flashbacks that we see concurrently with a story set in the present, but a full six issues? It'll be half a year before you get the next new origin story, and if one of them is terrible, no one will want to read the next one. Readership apparently agreed with that assessment, since the book started losing orders after this point, and by March of the next year, the book was cancelled. And yet, that's a little surprising given the actual order numbers that I've looked at for the book. The book was not doing that badly. While it had begun in the New 52 as a top 10 title with 98,000 orders and steadily lost readership down to 58,000 by the time these issues were released, that's not the worst drop in the world. In fact, it seems like the readership was fairly steady around that time. By the time it reached its final issue, number 29, it had gone down to 34,000. That's not great, but it was actually doing better than Superman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Batgirl, and several Marvel titles like Captain America and Iron Man. Speculation I could find about the cancellation pointed to the then-upcoming release of the weekly series Batman Eternal, and DC deciding it didn't want to have too many Batman books on the stand at once. Didn't friggin' stop them from doing it in the first place with the new 52, why shy away from it now? But in any event, the issues we looked at last time were pretty bad. Are these ones any better? So let's dig into Batman The Dark Knight number 16 and 17 to find out. <laughs> cover for issue 16 is pretty damn good, actually. Batman's crawling out of the top hat of the Mad Hatter with the promotional text exclaiming, Trapped in the chaos of the Mad Hatter! It's less chaotic and more like he has a lot of mud in here for some reason. 
I know it's just artistic flair, but I do find it weird that Batman's cape is actually forming into bat wings around the side of the hat. I don't know if that's dumb or neat. Also, gotta love how comic covers sometimes hype up new shows and movies, like this new hit series, Arrow. I'm pretty sure nothing ever came of that. We open with a kind of weird angle of Batman leaping into the cockpit of the Batplane while in the cave. Gotham's coming apart at the seams. Not the first time. We go through this every Black Friday! Apparently there have been riots in the city over a massive wave of kidnappings across it. A lot of whom eventually show up dead. There's no discernible pattern. I prefer patterns. You think this bat suit started without a pattern? This used to be a Superman design I got at Joanne Fabrics. The kidnappers appear to be operating out of some kind of sweatshop in Gotham's Chinatown, and the cops are on their way to get there, but they won't arrive in time before they move out. Fortunately, Batman has, well, a jet and manages to arrive. And these kidnappers are friggin' armed with rocket launchers! I'd say that's overkill for a trafficking ring like this, but on the other hand, this is the DC Universe, where a dude dressed up like a beetle could show up and wreck your operation in five minutes in an airship shaped like a beetle. And for some reason, we have a cutaway to a little kid playing with a ray gun who spots the bat plane crashing after he shoots the ray gun out the window. I'm sure it's supposed to be a comedic cutaway, but honestly, I'm more amused by the two liter bottle of what is no doubt called Popsy on the windowsill. You would never catch me drinking Popsy. I'm a Cuba Cola man myself. Why are there just a bunch of soda bottles and cans sitting on the windowsill? Anyway, Batman crashes right outside the trafficker's base in a two-page spread. For some reason, despite being armed with rocket launchers mere seconds ago, the traffickers come running at Batman with clubs and baseball bats instead. This goes about as well as you would expect for them. They have me from every direction. 17 to 1. I call that a fair fight. I call that insufficient thin mints for one person. One of the traffickers is wearing a crappy wig that falls off when Batman hits him with some batarangs in the leg, but before we can think about why that happened, the guy is immediately gunned down by his fellow criminals. They'll kill one another just to get to me. Actually, it was to take down the wig. That thing was not flattering. While the Batplane is in no shape to fly after the fleeing traffickers, who have a victim with them, its engines apparently still work, so Batman does the most logical thing. He activates the jet engine engines on it and rides after them. Alfred, I hope you're recording this because I think this might be the most awesome thing I've ever done. Sir, I'm fairly certain someone is going to die thanks to this stunt. Don't care, da 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 Batman! Oh, but that's not enough. He's doing this so he can get in close enough to launch a micro-explosive on the door of the van he's chasing, blow a hole in it without injuring anyone inside, leap in, grab a victim, and then leap out again. The van, in turn, crashes and explodes into the bat plane! Well, sir. You have indeed gotten people killed with that. Nah, it's okay, Alfred. I can see their parachutes. Their pa- Master Wayne, they were in a van! I am the knight, Alfred! Th that has nothing to do with- Batman! But yeah, as if to counter the idea that he just killed some people, we see a bunch of them fleeing from the explosion. Even if their proximity to that wouldn't kill them, there's no way in hell they could have gotten out of there. Bull crap! While Batman was able to save the one woman, he admits they were still able to get away with dozens of other people. And he's not sure why. After all, they were just sweatshop workers, so what was so important about keeping so many of them? Alfred drops a bat cycle as the police arrive, driving away from the woman who wanted him to stick around because of how frightened she was. Which is probably for the best. While a well-written Batman story does care about the victims of these tragedies, He's not really qualified to handle this sort of trauma. As your therapist, I think your anxiety is based around disappointing your parents. Back at stately Wayne Manor, Bruce arrives late to a date with his latest love interest in the book that I'm sure is totally going somewhere, Natalia Trusevich, a Ukrainian piano player who doesn't buy Bruce's excuses about the very visible injuries on his face. Car crash. The mist tonight. I wrecked the Aston on the guardrails. You must be used to having stupid women around. I mean, the marriage to Catwoman I was going to have got undone for some of the dumbest logic she had, so... 
She lectures to him about understanding the need to keep things to yourself, but there are ways to compromise, especially if one is in a relationship. There are whole parts of your house I've never seen. This manner, it's like a metaphor. That's a simile. No. No, it isn't. If she had said, your life is like this manner, or something similar, yes, but she didn't. Or did you mean, this manner, it's like a metaphor, is the simile, which is just pedantic and weird to point out. Hell, the rest of her sentence is a friggin' metaphor. Dark, complex, with rooms shut off. There are nights where I don't know where you are. I mean, I guess you could stretch it into being a simile, kind of? But this feels forced, especially just that he's pointing it out for no good reason in an effort to deflect her talk. But whatever, point is she wants him to trust her and says if he can't, then she's leaving him. And so he walks off, because dark and brooding and yada yada yada. Anyway, we cut to the Iceberg Casino, where the Penguin's legitimate business is operated out of. He's confronted by Batman, who accuses him of being behind the kidnappings. It's a huge operation, citywide. Few have that kind of reach. The weaponry's high-tech, the kind you could get your flippers on. Plus, some of the kidnappers wear bowler hats, like your thugs. Damn, I was undone by forcing my minions to stay on brand. The Penguin denies this, especially pointing out that if he had any solid evidence, he wouldn't be talking to him. He'd just smash the window and grab him. Damn, now I'm undone by needing to stay on brand. And besides, my simple, simple bat, I'm not the only player in town who's partial to haberdashery. Credit where it's due, that's kind of a brilliant triple meaning, since the traditional definition of haberdashery refers to men's clothing, and particularly hats, so it's referring to the bowler hat thing. It can also refer to small items used in sewing, which goes to the sweatshop thing, and finally, there's a haberdashery acting as kind of a synonym for shenanigans, referring to the crime spree. Kudos. Specifically, though, it seems it's the hat thing, since we cut over to the Mad Hatter at the Wild Hair nightclub. Okay, Gotham City really needs to just put a law in place about naming your club anything creative that might refer to supervillain activity. I'm pretty sure the villains themselves don't start these places up. They just move in when they hear the name. The Hatter is instructing his own minions, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, to take someone at the nightclub who will apparently be perfect for his needs. Want me to fix you a real drink, boss? Oh, that's okay. The tea's just fine. Ah, I see the Mad Hatter just read the celebrity gossip about Bruce Wayne and Natalia Trusevich breaking up. Batman returns to the crime scene of the earlier battle with the traffickers, and despite the police having put up tons of evidence signs and police tape, apparently no one noticed the big obvious wig just lying in the middle of all that and never took it in for evidence. Batman, however, immediately goes to it and examines it, finding one of the Mad Hatter's mind control chips inside the lining. Meanwhile, the guy the Mad Hatter picked out is forced to wear an oversized jacket as he, partially drugged, is confused about what happened. The Hatter instructs him to read the line, right this way, with as much conviction as possible, but he's unsatisfied with his performance. So he shoots him. Dude, what the hell? You didn't even give him a chance to study the part. This is why you're stuck in development hell. One of the Hatter's henchmen decides to question the Hatter about this. And considering the Hatter just murdered a man in cold blood in front of him, perhaps he should have been given the moniker of Tweedledum. Look, uh, excuse me, Mad Hatter, uh, uh, Mr. Hatter. For me and, and some of the others, it's getting a little out of hand. I mean, look around. This is madness. Fetch my ladder. I wish to kick this man in the face and yell, this is Sparta. We're in a reboot universe now, so the old memes are okay to use again. He tells the man that he appreciates him saying how he really feels, but then claws out his eyes and kills him in order to make sure no one else there tries to question him, ending the issue. Good job showing everyone how not crazy you are, Jervis. This is why you get to wear the biggest hat. Issue 17's cover is also pretty good, though a bit weird as if the Alice in Wonderland motif could be anything but weird, as we see said imagery in the background. I'm quite fond of the skull flowers in the bottom right. What do you plant to grow skull flowers? Teeth? And Bruce himself, front and center, waving his arms like he was Frankenstein while his eyes glow a bright green. No, I'm radioactive! That can't be good! 
Battling back a wonderland of madness. Depicted here, battling. At a baseball game, Tetch has set up some kind of stand where he's selling hats. And at first I was wondering how he isn't recognized as a supervillain right away by anyone walking around. But truth be told, Gotham has like dozens of supervillains any given day of the week, so it's probably hard to keep track of every asshole who picks up a gimmick. Behold, Batman! I am your undoing! Fidget Cube Man! I need something to do with my hands. It's very calming. He even sells a hat to an annoying kid who won't stop asking questions, so once he puts the hat on, Jervis makes him punch himself. I'm pretty sure this is supposed to be funny, but it really isn't. What's funnier is on the two-page spread that follows, with Batman sitting in the middle of a bunch of Minority Report holographic monitor things as he tries to track down the Mad Hatter. There's no record of Jervis Tetch anywhere but the Bata mining software traced a few wire transfers from his accounts before he disappeared. Bata mining. Bata mining. Let us down the rabbit hole. Apologies, but is it really worse than Bata mining? No, Alfred, it is not. It is, in fact, hilariously stupid. While a play on words kind of works, because data can also be pronounced data, it's very rare to see someone say data mining instead of data. As a result, his pun instead looks like it's saying beta mining, which means he's either trying to get his hands on some cryptocurrency, or he's found the beta of a Pokemon game and is desperately trying to dig into its code looking for interesting things. Why even the attempt at a pun? I accept stuff like Bat Computer because it's just a modifier on an existing item. What the hell makes this form of seeking out information so unique that it requires the Bat trademark on it? Behold, Alfred! I have made a new form of coffee. I call it bat fee. Master Bruce, I made that coffee. And I have improved it with batness. Also, Master Bruce, why do you have an issue title amidst all your holographic monitors? I think you will find, Alfred, that it is actually called a bat shoe title. He's correlated the data to see that, indeed, every spot where a person has been kidnapped is a place where the Mad Hatter has been cultivating influence through bribes, shell companies, and offshore accounts. He tells all this to Commissioner Gordon. How many corporations does he have? I stopped counting after ten. Ran out of fingers? And the boots are laced tight. I mean, you could have also used those big horn things on your head. They're ears, Jim! God, you're just like Linkara, mistaking them for horns. They don't look like bat ears, and they're really tall and pointy. I don't think it's unfair to call them horns. Yeah, well, I'm Batman, and I wear really tight boots, so shut up! Gordon wants to start raiding the locations, but Batman thinks it'd be a mistake. The tangle of businesses he's operating would make it nearly impossible to get them all, but what's more, all of the people working at them are under mind control anyway, so attacking them might just get innocent people hurt. The main company they're operating, though, is sponsoring a picnic dinner for Gotham Pediatric Hospital tomorrow, so Gordon thinks he can put a few unmarked cars and undercover cops there. Oh, yeah, here's where I turn around and you're gone. Nope, still here. Okay, then. Right. Well. That was necessary. I guess. After a scene where the Mad Hatter doesn't murder a woman who screams, help me, help me, perfectly for him, we get a flashback to Jervis's childhood, where a bully tries to intimidate him, but a bunch of his friends defend him, even whack the bully with a wiffle bat. Jervis is also quite enamored with a girl named Alice, whom he tells his father about at their hat-making store. This felt is so smooth. You know what they used for curing felt back in the day? Mercurious nitrate. No one knew it then, but exposure to the vapors could poison a hatter. Those poor fellows got all kinds of ailments. Dementia, trembling hands, hallucinations. Obviously the trembling hands was the worst, because then they couldn't make good hats. Nowadays, of course, they can do it more safely. Making hats. It's like building character, Jervis. That's a simile, Jervis. Take note of that, or else some asshole on the internet might nitpick it in the future. With a suggestion from his dad, Jervis asks Alice out on a date, but the flashback ends and we see Jervis's minions working on clothes and sets for whatever he's going to put on. He gets annoyed at one tailor's work on a jacket, that the pocket isn't slanting at the correct angle. That's a 45 degree angle. It should be 30. I don't see what the difference is. No? Let me help! 
and he twists the guy's head around and breaks his neck. Do you see now? Honestly, not really, but I think that's because I'm at 180 degrees now. We cut to Bruce changing into Batman as he prepares to head to the charity picnic. Alfred notes the absence of Natalia Trusevich and wonders if it's okay to talk to him about it. What's to talk about? Natalia's gone. Just gone? Like the others before. Yes, but she was different. You and I both know that. Yes, she truly was a unique and interesting character, an unforgettable and well-loved presence in the Batman mythos. Which is why I had never heard of her until I had to review these comics. At the picnic, some of the Hatter's minions lure a kid over to a secluded spot to kidnap him, but Batman swoops in and saves him. Also, the Batplane he's using here is based on the Tim Burton one. Nifty. Always liked that design. He beats up the goons, who withdraw to their van and drive off, but Batman placed a tracker on it. Back at the Hatter's hideout, he rambles to his minions, who I'm guessing he's poisoned given the silhouettes and how he's given them a very special tea. However, it's possible they're fine, since he explains that it just induces a dream state that allows you to remember your fondest memories, which he does with a flashback to going on that date with Alice. Naturally, it is to an amusement park themed after Alice in Wonderland, because villains like this are kind of on a one-track direction in life. Just saying, it'd be really embarrassing if the guy who modeled himself after the Mad Hatter ended up in a Chronicles of Narnia amusement park. The date apparently went very well, though the flashback ends as we get back to reality, with Tweedledee and Dumb informing Tetch of Batman's arrival. That being said, Batman can't quite find the base itself. The van is stopped in the middle of nowhere. Also, the moon is huge, as per usual in comic books. Admittedly, not as massive as some comics, but rest assured, it's still on track to collide with the Earth at some point. Petty One, get me optics for a half mile radius. Heat signature. Every living life form. Nothing bigger than a bunny. So, it could be a poodle! Alfred, I've had problems with poodles before. Scan for them! I think we're on to something here! Initiate short pulse lasers to image beneath the Earth's surface. Isn't it nice that I have all these orbiting satellites under my control? I should totally retrofit one of them to monitor all superhuman activity. I'm sure that was never a problem in any previous continuity. They can't find anything because the Hatter's base is inside of an abandoned missile silo with tons of reinforced concrete blocking the scans. I'm so glad that nice vault tech representative told me about this place. And so our comic ends with Batman departing, confused by his failure, while the Mad Hatter comes up to the surface and drinks some of his drugged tea, seeing Alice in the sky. Until the images warp and, well, things apparently not going well after that date. You know, guys, I got a feeling everything is gonna work out just fine between Jervis and Alice. These comics are... okay for the most part. The story is so far not hugely compelling. Part of it is the nature of decompressed storytelling. Not a lot has happened in just these two issues, other than setting up the Mad Hatter kidnapping people for some nefarious purpose, mind controlling them, and the start of his revised origin story. However, the story is not terrible or anything, it's just a bit slow. Part of the padding of that ends up with just continual reminders that the Mad Hatter is well, homicidally psychopathic. There's nothing wrong with that on its own, since he is the villain and we're supposed to see how dangerous he is as a result of that, but at the same time, it feels a bit too Joker-esque for me. The creepiness of the Mad Hatter comes in his obsessions and mind control technology, since mind control is a very scary and creepy idea. It feels like the people under his control have a lot more free will than they should be exercising, given what's being done to them. After all, what's the point of minions who will talk back to you like the one he needed the ladder for? Shouldn't they just be mindlessly obedient? But it's not bad at all, just not that interesting. Next time, another Patreon-sponsored review, as this show gets a little bit closer to Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. As well as going into the right damn rec room!
hey guys, was gonna make a bigger video about this, but truth be told, more people will probably see this here. Long story short, tax time is really not fun for self-employed people like myself. We're required to pay quarterly estimated taxes to the government or receive a small penalty when normal tax time rolls around. I try to make the payments as I can, but oftentimes I can't afford it for certain quarters. The quarterlies are supposed to also, in turn, reduce the total amount owed to the government around tax time, but last year was a bit tricky. While I ended up making more money, the actual cost of living went up. Increased rent, increased health care, the car crash, etc, etc. Basically, I owe $7,600 to the government. And I can't afford that, even if I was to try to break it down to smaller amounts to pay over the next few months, like I've done in the past. So we're gonna have ourselves a fun little fundraiser stream. Starting tomorrow, April 9th, and going through April 11th, I'm gonna be playing a randomized Nuzlocke of Pokemon Yellow version and stream it all to you guys. I'll only take breaks to sleep and eat, and during the eating breaks, I'll play some episodes. But the main thing here is the randomized Nuzlocke. I'm randomizing everything. All 151 Pokemon available in the game are gonna have different types than normal. This Pikachu? Maybe it's a ghost now! This Charizard? Maybe it's finally the dragon type it should have always been! This thing? Should not show up at all, since Yellow Version's missing number is not normally accessible without cheating, and it's not helpful like Red and Blue's was. In any event, come on in for three days of streaming Pokemon Yellow. What will our starter be? What type will our starter be? Who knows? I sure as hell don't. I'll have a Google Doc ready for us to keep track of this wonderland of a stream, and we'll have guests popping in and out to keep us company. So come on down and watch the stream, do some super chats if you're able and willing to, or just watch it to show your support and I look forward to people discovering this video years later and posting about how this is radically out of date because YouTube doesn't let you re-upload a video over an old one like Blip used to. Or Vimeo. Man, I missed that feature. Pokemon Yellow Randomized Nuzlocke Stream starts at 1 p.m. Central Time on YouTube. Watch us take on our rival, Taxes. Also, Contest of Champions resumes later this month. Just probably not for next week because, you know, stream.